And good evening. We're very happy to welcome each of you tonight, and we hope that you have had a good day, and we invite you into our study of the book of Revelation. We hope that it's been helpful to you as we've been going through the book of Revelation. We have come to the 17th chapter, and we're actually into the last part of the 17th chapter tonight, and we'll be going through taking a look at what it has to say. But the study of the book of Revelation is probably one of the most important books in the Bible for people that are living today because it deals with the time in which you and I are living. And it helps us know exactly what is happening. Uh, you can understand what the Scripture says. And Christ said, I have told you these things before they happen so that when it takes place, you may believe. Well, you and I can see from Scripture certain things, and as you look at news and you see the th events happening, you can see how that is fulfilling Scripture. And so the book of Revelation is a great, great book to study and to understand what is happening and taking place. So we're glad you're with us. We welcome all those of you that are joining us by television, or if you're tuning in on the radio or actually watching through the Internet, we're very glad that you're here, and we hope that the book of Revelation will become very, very real to you. Tonight, we're taking a look at the ten kings. Ten kings. These ten kings are consistently mentioned throughout the Scripture. They're, they have a very definite part to play in the last days. And so it's important that you and I understand who these ten kings are, what they're going to do, and how it all fits together. And that's what we're looking at tonight, is these ten kings. Uh, tomorrow night, or our next presentation, I should say, is we're going to move into the 18th chapter, Revelation, on God's last call. Uh, we're down to the end of the book. We're down to the end of the book of Revelation, folks. And uh, there's not any more after this. I don't know if people understand that, but when you get this far in the book of Revelation, it's, it's basically over. And what the powers that are against God, that have been working against God, that all pretty much ends in the 17th chapter. The 18th chapter is God making an appeal to people to not be lost, to be in his kingdom. And that's what we'll be looking at tomorrow evening as we take a look at God's last call. But uh, tonight, the Ten Kings, so we hope that you'll follow it carefully as we take a look at these Ten Kings. Again this evening, uh, Donna Klein is going to be singing for us, going to sing a song about heaven and about uh, being there, and it's entitled Almost Home, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It's a song that I always enjoy very much that she wrote, so we hope it'll bless you. But, be but before she sings, uh, Chuck's going to come out and read for you the scripture that we're going to be looking at tonight in the 17th chapter. Good evening. If you have your Bibles with you, I would invite you to turn them to Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to read Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 through 18. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's read together. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beasts. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The ten horns which you saw in the beasts, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate, and naked, 
eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind to, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. May God add his blessing to his word. There are five different powers that are mentioned in tonight's study. It's very important that you and I identify each of these powers and see how they are involved in the last day, particularly, because we can know what is happening, what's taking place, and how this will all fit together in the last days. So we need to identify these five different powers. And, of course, the one that we're going to take a look at, in particular tonight, is the ten kings. We need to know who are those ten kings, what they're doing, what is happening, what's taking place with them. We need to understand exactly who the ten kings are. Another power that we've talked about and we've identified before, but we need to make sure we know who we're talking about, and that's the beast, which the Scripture identifies as that of the papal power that we'll be looking at tonight because we've got to see what is the beast relationship to the ten kings. Is there a relationship? How does this fit together with the ten kings? You need to understand that clearly. And so we'll take a look at the beast, identify who the beast is. Then we need to also know and understand who is the harlot or Babylon. We need to identify Babylon clearly so you and I know when the Scripture's speaking about Babylon, what's it talking about? What's the difference between Babylon and the beast? We need to understand that. So we've got the ten kings, we've got the beast, we've got Babylon. We've, those are three different powers, and we need to see how they interrelate with one another. And then we have the false prophet, which the Scripture identifies, and we find in our study that this false pro prophet is the United States. And so now we've got to see how the beast and the false prophet fit into all this and how it all comes together. So these are all different powers that are involved in tonight's presentation. And then, of course, last of all, we've got to take a look at the Lamb, the King of kings, Lord of lords. How does that come together? So those are the five different powers that we're going to look at in tonight's presentation and see how they relate to one another and what is happening and taking place. So let's take a look at the ten kings and see what it tells us about these ten kings and who they represent and how it all comes together. It says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings. So this beast has ten horns. He said the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Very important text. It says they've received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Uh, that word one hour, some people would like to take that and uh, apply the prophetic yardstick to it where they say that a day represents a year, which the Scripture does give us. And some will take that and apply that and say this represents basically 15 days. Uh, I don't really know that that can be used. I do know that it, from the original it means a very short time. So that, I think, is more in thinking or in keeping with what we're talking about. Also, when it talks about ten kings... There are some people that would take and say this represents ten actual kings. Uh, the word, the number ten is used in Scripture many times to represent a total more than an actual number of ten. It represents 
the ten kings could be a number of kings all coming together and working together. Uh, but it means total more than it does anything else. But those are the ten kings, and they receive authority for one hour with what? With the beast. So they're going to be involved here with the beast. These are of one mind, and they give their power and authority to the beast. It says they are of one mind. That does not mean, folks, that these ten kings are going to come and there's just going to be one. It doesn't mean that. It means that there will be a number of them, but they will work together. They will be of one mind. They'll work together. That doesn't mean there's just one kingdom. It means there's many kingdoms, but they're working together. They are of one mind, and they give their authority to the beast. Rather interesting observation here. When it says they give their authority to the beast, please notice they do not give it to the woman who is riding on the beast. They give their authority to the beast. We're going to come back to that and talk about it. It's very important that we understand that. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. So God said, okay, here are these nations. I'm going to let them fulfill my purpose, all right, to be of one mind, working together, and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Do you understand what that means? Until the words of God are fulfilled, it means that those ten kings are going to go be involved clear up to the end, to the coming of Christ. So these are things that are happening in the last days. That, that's what they're involved with. Now, ten kings has been used over and over and over through Scripture, time and time again. You go to Daniel 2, verse 44, and it talks about an image there that had ten toes, and it says clearly in Scripture that those ten toes are ten kings. So it represents there, and again, the number 10, meaning total more than just the number 10. You go to Daniel 7, and you have a beast that has 10 horns, and it says in Daniel 7, these 10 horns are 10 kings. So you have the 10 again. You move into the book of Revelation, and Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 3, talks about the dragon there, and it having 10 horns, on it, which it says represented ten kings. Again, it's repeated in Revelation 13, and again, of course, here in Revelation 17. In all those cases, folks, it's talking about the same power. It's talking about the same ten kings. It's consistent all the way through Scripture. It's not taking some ten over here and some ten over here. It's the same ten all the way through. And those ten, it makes very clear, had to be, had to be in Western Europe. It identifies them as being in Western Europe, and they were made up of the Germanic tribes that came down and overran the Roman Empire, and they were such kingdoms as the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Early Eye, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and so forth. And folks, this will become very, very important tonight, so watch carefully because these nations of Western Europe, or these tribes, became the nations of Western Europe. They became such countries as Germany, and Italy, and France, and England. Anglo-Saxons became the English, the Franks became the French, and so forth. They became the nations of Western Europe, and so when it talks about ten kings, it's talking about these ten kings in Western Europe. So those are the ones that are involved here, and these ten kings will play a major role in the last days. Now, back in 1991, the common market, as it was referred to back then today, it's known as the 
European Union was just getting started, just forming. And even though it was just starting, the London Telegraph came out with this statement. I want you to listen to it. If Europe federalism triumphs, the EC, that's the European community, will indeed be an empire. It will lack an emperor, but it will have the pope. It is difficult not to think that Wotala, who is the pope, realizes this. In other words, they're saying these ten kings are going to make up an empire and it will be very much involved with the pope. These ten kings will give their authority to the beast. Okay. So begin to put it together as to what's going on. Now watch carefully. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind. That means these nations are going to come together and they're going to work together. And we find that's exactly what's happening. Uh, you go over there today and, and folks, when you move, we don't understand it because we went through this 200 years ago. Uh, where, you know, we decided that we were all going to work together. And so we have all the states, and they all work together. But that was not the case in Europe. There was countries, all different countries, little countries. And so when all of a sudden they decide to put together a European Union, you got major problems. What would you consider one of the big, big problems? Well, they speak different languages. Major problem. Secondly, major problem on weights and measurements. And all that had to be worked out. Money. All had different currency. All those were major problems that they had to work out. But today, you go over there and you can drive across England and France and Germany and all through there, and it seems to be working. They are of one mind okay working together and gave their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled this was what was to happen this is the uh, poster uh, for the European community or European Union and that's the stars that at that time I, I don't know exactly what the number is right now of the number of nations that are together but there's far more than 10, I'll assure you that. But it means, as I said, more total. And you might notice what it says there, Europe, many tongues, one voice. See, they're working together. Well, I want you to take a look at this. This is the headquarters for the European Union. That's where these 10 kings are all involved. European Union. This is what is outside their headquarters. Do you see what's there? You have a woman riding on a beast. That's what they use to represent them, is this woman riding on a the beast. They even have it on their money. So you have that exactly what is taking place there today. We must understand that today this is a major player, a major power in the world because these folks have the largest army in the world. The euro is right there as far as the dollar is concerned. In fact, there's some countries that want to say, stop taking the dollar and start transferring it all to euros. You have this. So these are major factors in the world today in which they are there. So these are the ten kings. All right, the beast. Because he's very much playing here because they give their power and authority to the beast. And we have found, it says here in Revelation 13, verse 1, then I stood on the sand of the sea, saw a beast riding up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, on his horn ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. 
Well, we found out that this represents papal Rome. We identified that. The Scripture gives eight points of identification, and we looked at those and identifies it clearly. Okay, what, what part is it playing with the ten kings? Watch. These are of one mind, okay? And they will give their power and authority to the beast. Is there anything happening today that begins to show that things are going that way? Pope Benedict XVI urged the European Union not to forget its Catholic Christian roots. As, receive, as he received the EU, that's the European Union, new envoy to the Vatican on Monday, October the 19th, 2009. Now listen to what he has to say. Europe will not truly be herself if she cannot keep the originality that made her great. Now you've got to understand what he's meaning when he says originality. The Pope said he encouraged the continent to promote the holistic development of people that the Catholic Church considered to be the only way to remedy imbalances present in the world. Now listen. The Pope also said he was pleased at the excellent relations between the European Union and the Holy See, and the Church wanted to help in the construction of the European Union. Union. So let me assure you, they very much have a hand in what is going on. So when it says they will give their power and authority to that of the beast, there is movements taking place today for that. Now you need to understand the political background and what's happening here to put it together. This is a map of the Euro European Union. This is a map of the nations that we're talking about, the ten different ones. And so here, in if you can see the difference in the blue, all those that are in blue, the majority in those countries are Roman Catholic. Okay? Those in the purple, which is more towards the top, those are Protestant. Okay? Those in the red over there are Eastern Orthodox, okay? And those in the green, those are Islam, okay? Can you put those together? Because I'm about to read you a statement that makes a great, great difference. This statement was given by Charles Malik. Charles Malik was the uh, ambassador to the United States, Lebanon. He taught at Harvard, uh, very much involved in the United Nations and what went on there. I want you to listen to what he says. The only hope for the Western world lies in an alliance between the Roman Catholic Church, which is the most commonly influential, controlling, unifying element in Europe. Now, did you catch that? All right. Roman Catholic Church, which is the most commonly influential, controlling, unifying element in Europe, and the Eastern Orthodox Church, Rome must unite with Eastern Orthodoxy. Rome must unite with Eastern Orthodoxy. Why? Because the Eastern Orthodox Church controls Western Middle East, the east end of the Mediterranean. And if they don't solidify that control, Islam will march across Europe. Islam is political. Now listen. The only hope for the Western world lies then in a united Europe 
under the control of the Pope. And then all Protestant Christians around the globe must come into submission to the Pope so we will have a unified Christian world. Now, let's see what he's saying, folks. He's saying that the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox need to unite, come together. And the reason, he said, is because the Eastern Orthodox Church controls Western Europe. Or the, all right, look at it. Look at your map again. There you have it. You see there, you have all the blue. The red, folks, is Eastern Orthodox. They control that whole part of the world. Below them is Islam. So if Catholicism and them don't unite, then Islam can march across Europe. Begins to help you begin to see what's happening out there and what's going to take place. And there are things that are happening today that begin to bring that together. Uh, you just in the last month, there were news about the uh, Catholic Church, Ethan Orthodox Church coming together, uh, different ones uniting with it. You find changes that are taking place that are beginning to open the door for that. Okay, let's take a look at Babylon, a harlot. You must understand when we talk about Babylon that Babylon is a system, a religious system. And it's not just one. It's uniting of several. And that is the reason it's called Babylon, because it is confusion. Let's see what it says about it. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this woman... Riding on the beast, and as I told you last night, when a woman is sitting on something, that means she controls it. So she is controlling the beast. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abomination, the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlot, and of the abomination of the earth. So she is the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So you need to put it down clearly that this woman is not in accord with the Scripture. She's not in the same league as with the Lord. She is in opposition to it. And you don't have to be when I say in opposition, that doesn't mean you, don't, you have to be non-religious. You can be religious and be in opposition. You need to understand that. And she is. She's religious. She's a spiritual power. But she's certainly not in keeping with the Word of God. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So if she's sitting... On the waters, that means she is controlling the people, the nation's tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will, what? Hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Now here, you have these ten horns that have given her their power and authority, and now the Scripture is saying, they turn against her and hate her and burn her with fire. So there's going to be a total change of mindset here about these ten kings and their attitude to the woman. But God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman who you saw is that, what? Great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So put it down. When the scripture speaks of Babylon as a city, that's the same as the woman. There's no difference between the woman and the city. It's still Babylon. 
So it's, she is that great city. So you need to have that clear in your mind. Okay, watch what happens here. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. So here we have these frogs coming out of these three uh, beasts, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. For they are the spirit of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So here we have three powers. We have the dragon, we have the beast, and we have the false prophet. And out of their mouth is going frogs that are demons that are deceiving the whole world. Now watch. Now the great city, which is who? Is Babylon. Okay, now the great city was divided into how many parts? Okay, are you putting it together? Was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine and the fierceness of her wrath. So you have the city divided into three parts, and the reason it's divided into three parts is because you have the dragon, you have the beast, and you have the false prophets. Those are the three parts. The dragon represents paganism. Papal power represents Catholicism. And the false prophet represents Protestantism. Protestantism that at one time was given the grace of God and preached the word of God and followed it in the last days has given it up and no longer stands for what their original fathers stood for and fought for. They've given it up. And so Babylon, which is a spiritual power, folks, not a political power. It is a spiritual power. I told you last night that when it talks about a spiritual power or a church it always uses it in the feminine. feminine. She refers to it as she. Civil power is always referred to as he. And so you have those two there, and it's divided the kingdom into three parts. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. What has happened is she has taken over civil power. That's the reason it says that she's riding on the beast, or she's sitting on the waters, or, she set, or she's that city. It's saying that she, as a spiritual power, has taken over civil power. But please notice that these ten kings did not give their authority to the woman. They gave their authority to the beast. You see, a church power or a spiritual power has never had the power to execute things. The church power has always had to use a civil power. And as you read down through history, it's always been that if a church got in control, they used the civil power to carry out their operations. And even Rome, the papal power, you don't find the papal power doing any of that. You find her using civil power to accomplish her purpose. And so here, these ten kings have given their authority to the beast when Babylon falls when Babylon is not doing what she promised them that she would do they are finding their, themselves deceived they turn against her they turn against her and hate her burn with fire they have nothing to do with her because all the things that she said have not happened have not taken place this is what it's telling us has happened here then he said to me the waters where you saw which you saw where the harlot sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. She ruled over them. 
but her rule has come to an end. Now watch carefully. Then the sixth angel poured out his bow on the great river, what? Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now, water represents what? People, nations, tongues. Okay. It says that the Euphrates was dried up. Well, you can make some comparisons here, folks, if you just go back in your mind to Babylon of old. And Babylon of old, through the river flowed, or through the city flowed the river Euphrates. And then we find that Cyrus came, you remember, and uh, the people even crawled up on the wall and threw food to him and laughed at him, took his army down, and they diverted the river Euphrates into canals, and they dried up the Euphrates so that they could get inside the city of Babylon. So it's saying here, in the last days, the waters will be dried up. What's it talking about? It's talking about the, all the opposition that has been to God and his kingdom. All that is dried up. The waters are dried up the people. All those that were in opposition, the woman and what she had done, she is hated, she's burned with fire, she's done away with. That's drying up the Euphrates, that the way of the king of the east might be prepared. And when it's talking about the king of the east, it's referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. So the river is dried up in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So he said clearly, this is right there, that same chapter, that this would be the coming of Jesus Christ. The kings, by the word way, that word is kings, it's plural. It refers to more than one. So why would it use more than one concerning the coming of Christ? When it says to prepare the way of the kings of the east. Well, very simple. Because you and I are kings. That's what the scripture says. And he has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And so when it says that would prepare the way for the kings of the east, it's referring to the coming of Jesus Christ coming back. Well, what about the false prophet? How does the false prophet fit into all this? We've seen the beast. We've taken a look at the harlot. We've looked at the ten kings. Now, the false prophet. What about him? And he exercised all the authority of the... Whoa. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence and caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Interesting. We have the ten kings given their power and authority to the beast. And now we have this power, the false prophet, if you please, giving his power and authority to the beast. He performed great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He's given great, great power to perform signs. Now, what's he going to do with this? And he deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. So he's been able, this false prophet, to deceive the world. Deceive the world into doing something. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now he's going to make an image to the beast who had been wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. 
that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now he, he has done great signs. The people have turned to him, believed him, and he's told them they need to make an image to the beast. The beast power stands for what? Well, the woman's riding on the beast, isn't she? Yeah, she's riding on the beast, which means when you have the woman riding on the beast, you have unification of church and state. And so if he's going to make an image of the beast, you've got to make it like the beast. And so you've got to have union of church and state coming together. And it says that the false prophet is the one that will give impetus to this to bring it about. Then the beast was captured, okay? And with him who? The false prophet who worked signs in his presence. You see, it's tying definitely the false prophet to this two-horned beast who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So it's telling us clearly that the United States would be foremost in pulling this together, bringing this union together in which all of it is to work together and do what they think and promise that it will do. So we find our things going that way today. Well, we have a Supreme Court Nine justices. Tonight, five out of the nine are Roman Catholic. Sad to say, there is not a Protestant in the whole group. Roman Catholic. I, I, do, you understand, do you understand the power that these people have? They hold, folks, they literally hold the power of life and death. That's what they hold. So we find that one particular thing after another is moving us step by step closer and closer to this whole thing coming together, the time in which we're living today. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. When it uses the word speak and cause, that simply means, speak means legislation. Cause means enforcement. So it's telling us that it will be literally legislated and will be enforced this is how the image of the beast is set up and it says it would give life to the image of the beast it means it's going to come to life it will be enforced it'll actually happen so you and I as time goes by we can watch more and more the encroachment of church into political power and we've seen a great lot of that already in our day, in the age in which you and I are living. Okay, what about the Lamb? What's going to happen? Because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. These, speaking of the ten kings, these will make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Now, these, these ten kings, the beast, the false prophet, they will make war with the Lamb. 
What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean they're going to make physical war. It means that they teach in opposition to what God teaches. Uh, I just cannot emphasize enough that you and I must follow what this book teaches, folks. And if you are not spending time in the Word of God, you are putting your soul at jeopardy. If you're not spending time in the Word of God, you're putting your soul at jeopardy. Because you and I need to know what the Word of God says. Because that is your only that is your only defense. That is your only hope. And when it says they will make war with the Lamb, it makes it clear that they are drunk with the wine of Roman Babylon. And therefore they're going to teach things that are contrary to the Word of God. And it may sound to you as logical as it can be, but if it does not agree with the Word of God, it is not truth. And, and you can have something, folks, that is 95% truth and 5% error. It's still not truth. It's got to ring true to the Word of God. And so when it says they are in opposition to the Lamb, then that means they're fighting against Him. He will overcome them. Okay? And the kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Christ will overcome him. He will set up his kingdom and will reign forever and ever. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Marvelous. That God is going to come and he's going to live here. The tabernacle of God is with man. Wonderful. Uh, do you understand? They just, here the other day, said they found out the universe is much bigger than we thought. Amen. Yeah. And, and here, of all the millions and billions and trillions of worlds, God's going to live here with us. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You see, tonight, the Lord is making a covenant with you. And God is saying, I'll be your God if you will be my people. And he gives you and I the privilege of making that decision, whether I want to be his people. Whether I want to say, yes, you're my God. I will walk with you. I will follow you. I will obey you. I will do your will. You just be my God. And he says, then you are my child. I'll be your God. You shall be my people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the marvelous assurance that Jesus is coming back. We ask, Lord, that each one of us may prepare our hearts, that we may open your word, and that we might hold to it tenaciously in all that we do. Bless each one and all that are listening, we pray. In your name, amen.